Hey all, Future Keysby here, and I'll make this quick. About three quarters into editing this video, I made some changes to the deck. I think they all overall help it a lot, but the idea of recutting this video caused me emotional, physical, and existential distress, so I have a segment at the end where I'm going to explain the changes. That said, you should watch the video in its entirety if you want to get the ins and outs of the Memento deck and archetype as we go in depth on what everything does, some relevant rulings, and the combos that this deck can produce, and there's honestly only one instance where I kind of contradict myself between past and future me. Also, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe because I forgot to mention that in my actual intro. Anyway, enjoy. Hey y'all, what is up? Kisby here, and today we're going to be looking at my post LEDE Memento All deck profile. <laughs> Okay, so up top, this deck currently is not playable in the TCG, as two of the key cards do not come out until the next core set. However, this deck gets a massive boost from these cards, and if you want to start taking this deck to your locals and beyond, now is a good time to start practicing with the new support so you can hit the ground running, as it totally changes up how this deck is going to be played. If you just want the deck profile I'm currently testing out, go ahead and skip to the timecode in the description, but if you want a bit of theory on it, we're going to talk for a bit. So overall, I like this deck. This list I'm showing off now is my current working list. However, I do want to preface that it is in progress and built to address more of what's being played now. So this may change up once we officially get these cards in hand. I've been finding a lot of success with this list overall, but it isn't perfect. While when fully set up, this deck can do a ton, the setup can be a bit fragile. Granted, with the two new cards we're getting in LEDE, we now have a lot of flexibility in our lines and potentially more playthrough for interruptions. However, a well-timed gate can still be pretty tragic if your hand is on the lower end of what this deck can produce. Going second as well, this deck does suffer a bit, as while hand traps can be rough and negation that both negates and removes a body from the field can fluctuate between non-bothersome to nearly helpful to turn-ending, again, everything really depends where you take the negation on. This deck is also somewhat tricky to play, there is a defined start and end to every line, but the roads between are a bit wild, and you are rewarded for being able to fluctuate in what you do based on opponent interaction. For those wondering, I am going to be skipping over covering a pre-LEDE version of this deck, as I didn't really do much testing with just the addition of Attic Ghosts, which I'm just learning is called Gaddock in the TCG, thanks, don't like that name at all. Until now, I had just been testing with the original support, but I've gotten so deep into integrating the LEDE support that I've really been focusing just on that version. The two new cards don't just add new lines, they actually retroactively alter everything that previously was doable with this deck. So even if you update your knowledge base with the lines for this deck to include Gaddock, you'll end up having to do it all over again once we get these new cards from LEDE. I've labbed out a whole video's worth of one card's lines this deck can produce now, so get ready for that as well. So far as this build, there is some non-budget friendly cards in here, but I have alternatives for the most important one, and the rest are on the side and easily replaceable. And lastly, I know Memento isn't technically the TCG name for this deck, and the card names are all slightly different. I'm going to be saying Memento instead of Memento at all, because I like it more, and I've been calling Gaddock by the TCG name for so long that I'm probably just going to call it Attic Ghost throughout this video. Alrighty, whether you stuck through the intro or skip directly here, let's kick this off with triple copies of Memento Darkblade, our retrain of Darkblade. If this is your first deck profile with the channel, we're going to go pretty in depth, so let's get into it. Three, because Darkblade is a one card starter for this deck. Previously, only himself and Anguish could one card start, but with the new cards from LEDE, all of our original Mementos, Sans... Mace are one card starters, and whereas previously Darkblade and Anguish as one card engines would only get combined creation with eventual Mace access, these now actually can end at a minimum on SP Little Knight or IP Mascarena, combined creation with eventual access to Memento Mace, one piece of back row, and our field spell. And the way we built the deck and how the combo lines work now, if all you had access to was one copy of Darkblade, your other four cards are most likely just generic power. Enough about why Darkblade, let's talk about what Darkblade. 
So my guy here has two effects. First, on normal or special summon, you can, as cost, discard a memento card and target a spell or trap your opponent controls and destroy it. It sounds only okay, but it does come up more often than you'd initially think, mostly for baiting infinite impermanences when you have Bone Party in hand. Additionally as well, it can work well if you get to summon it on your opponent's turn as a slower way of cracking a continuous back row with a slower ignition effect. His second effect is a semi-shared effect across multiple memento monsters, so we're going to cover the ins and outs of it up front right now. Darkblade, Anguish, Mace, Goblin, Tatsuno Toshigo, and Twin Dragon all have an effect that includes destroying a memento monster you control in order to resolve a unique portion of the effect. The only variance to this effect is Twin Dragon, who can also destroy a memento from hand as well as the field. So let's break down these effects so you don't lose out on any value. First and foremost, these effects, with one exception, do not have a cost. The destruction that occurs is part of the effect, not a cost of activation. In fact, the destruction is part of the effect resolving. So why is that important? Well, first, Attic Ghost does not trigger if discarded via Darkblade's back row destruction effect because that is a cost, but it will trigger if destroyed from the field or hand if you use Twin Dragon and get to summon itself. This bridges into any effects that interact specifically with destruction or being sent to Graveyard via that effect as well. Next, because the destruction happens as part of the resolution of the effect, it does not target. Generally, if you only have one memento on field, this isn't overly important, but we're going to highlight a few cases where it can be. First, and obviously, if you have more than one memento on field, you fire off Dark Blade's effect, and your opponent has quick play removal and chooses to use it to destroy the Dark Blade. You can, and actually must, still resolve the effect with your remaining memento monster. This can work for or against you depending on the circumstance, so just be aware of it. Alternatively, if Darkblade or any memento is negated instead of removed, nothing will end up being destroyed. Next, this means that Bone Party creates an interesting dodge for your effects. So let's change it up. You only have Darkblade and you use your effect. Chainlink 2, your opponent either attempts to remove or negate the Darkblade. You, on Chainlink 3, use Bone Party to destroy Darkblade and special summon a new memento from the deck. Chain resolves. Chainlink 3, Bone Party destroys Darkblade and special summon out, let's just say, Anguish in this case. Chainlink 2 resolves with that effect, and now on Chainlink 1, Darkblade can and must resolve, destroying the Anguish you summoned on Chainlink 3. So remember, this works specifically because the Memento Destruction doesn't target, so as long as we have something for it to destroy by the time it's resolving, we are golden. Additionally though, anything summoned in a scenario like this with an on summon trigger effect is unfortunately not going to trigger since it's being destroyed before it has a chance to go off on a new chain. That said, in this case, we're just going to use Dark Blade to blow up Anguish to summon another Anguish that will trigger, but still it's worth knowing. Altering that scenario, if you activate Dark Blade and you use Bone Party but opt to add the Memento Monster to hand instead of summoning it, despite the fact that Dark Blade is destroyed, it's destroyed via Bone Party, not its own effect, so Dark Blade's effect is not going to resolve in this case. And lastly, and this is a new one that came up during the scripting of this video, but called by the grave. The long and short of it is, I was recently playing, I used Dark Blade, no response, and then on resolution, when it hit the graveyard, my opponent attempted to use Call by the Grave. This absolutely does not work, because my opponent would have had to have used Called by the Grave in response to Darkblade's activation, but on activation there was no copy of Darkblade in the graveyard because it doesn't hit the graveyard until the chain is resolving, and Called by the Grave can't be added to the chain as the chain is resolving because you can't add new activations to a chain that is in the process of resolving. Okay, so all of that out of the way, Darkblade's unique effect is to special summon out a level 3 or lower memento monster from your deck. Generally, this is going to be Anguish, but keep in mind it's any level 3 or lower. This does come up in a few lines where you summon either Mace or Goblin. Both of his effects are hard once per turns. And what better time to talk about her? We've got Memento Anguish, a retrain of Fairy Witch. Three copies of her, as again, she is a one card starter, and most all our lines do funnel through her effect at some point. On normal or special summon, she can add any Memento monster from deck to hand except herself. Her secondary effect is to target a level 2 or lower memento monster in your graveyard, destroy a memento monster you control, and if you do, special summon the targeted monster. This is the only memento effect currently that has a cost in the form of targeting, but it's important to bear in mind that only the summon choice targets the destruction portion of the effect still does not. Both of her effects are hard ones per turns as well. 
Next up, we've got three copies of Memento Tatsuno Toshigo, a retrain of Tatsuno Toshigo. Three of him as well, as he is actually a one card engine now with the new support and is an extremely strong piece of a two card engine with the field spell. I've gone back and forth on two or three copies here, as with the added consistency the new support gives this deck, I think you could actually get away with two. It's between running three of him in a 40 card deck with no terraforming, more on that later, two of him plus one copy of terraforming and staying at 40 cards, or just doing a 41 card deck with three copies of him and one copy of terraforming. So if you want to test a little variance out, here's one spot for it. Additionally, I like three copies because it is a name for combined creation and it is a very useful name at that. Tatsu's first effect is if you control no face-up non-memento monsters, you can activate its effect and special summon him to the field. So some clarifications. This does work into an empty field, and it works into a field where you have face-down non-memento monsters. Just so long as they are not face-up, you're golden. It does activate, keep that in mind as well. Tatsu's on-field effect is to destroy a memento monster you control, and if you do, send mementos with different names from your deck to the graveyard, whose combined levels are equal to or less than that of the destroyed monster. So basically, if Tatsu self-destructs, you get five levels to work with. Again, playing with the ratios on this, but I've been liking three of them. Both of his effects are hard once per turn. Next, we're on another ratio in testing. Three copies of Memento Mace, a retrain of Key Mace. So Mace actually is the only one of the original mementos that isn't a one card engine. However, like Tatsu, it makes for a very strong two card engine with the field spell. Additionally, there are a fair amount of lines where you can burn through two of these. The effects are hard once per turns, it's more for the name, and always having one in hand is ideal since its second effect is remarkably strong. But first effect first, you can destroy memento monster you control, add any one memento card from deck to your hand, back row included, except for a copy of memento mace. So yeah, really strong. Additionally, if you control combined creation, during your opponent's main phase, you can discard memento mace to target a monster your opponent controls and take control of it until the end phase. Wishlist for this card would have had the monster you take control of be treated as a memento monster, but whatever. Overall, really strong, and now since this deck can almost always end with a Link 2 on board, ending with IP Mascarena is an incredibly strong move, as you can steal a monster with Mace, then link it off into either an SP Little Knight if you want to go that route, or Nightmare Unicorn for a more budget-friendly choice. Both of these effects are hard ones per turns. Hard ones per turns. Copy of Memento Goblin, a retrain of Goblin Calligrapher. Goblin's first effect is if you control combined creation during the main phase of either turn, you can discard him and until the end of the turn, your opponent cannot target memento monsters you control with card effects. This honestly doesn't come up too often, more often now however due to the new support making this much more accessible, but the fact that you can only do it during the main phase does give your opponent a huge opening to target immediately because they have turn player priority. Plus, this doesn't really do anything for non-targeted removal, but any protection is better than none. Next, Gobby's self-destruction effect is to pop a memento you control and send up to two memento cards with different names from your deck to the graveyard. This used to be pretty much exclusively for sending combined creation and either a back row or a fifth memento name, but now most combos funnel here into Attic Ghost and the Fusion Spell, more on that later. One copy, because while this is a one card start with a new support, it's far and away the most fragile one card start. The protection effect, again, while good, isn't worth getting this in rotation over mace generally if you had to choose, and one has just honestly felt like enough here. If you wanted to, you could consider a 2-2 split with this and mace, but I'm going with Prank Kids numbers here, where our monster one card starts are three copies, three copies, three copies, and one copy. Both of Goblin's effects are hard once per turns. This might be a contentious one of, but one copy of Memento Gaddock, or Attic Ghost, which is objectively the better name, a retrain of Wretched Ghost of the Attic. Attic Ghost has two effects. First, if it is sent to the graveyard via a Memento Monster's effect, you can special summon it. Then, if it's normal or special summoned, under any circumstance, you can add any one Memento card from your graveyard to your hand. Most of our combos funnel through sending Ghosty and Fusion to the graveyard via Goblin, which revs up our plays to more or less ensure, at a minimum, a link to and combined creation with one piece of back row. Even pre-LEDE, Attic Ghost does improve the lines this deck can access, but it really comes into its own when enabling our fusion plays. Only one copy, as I personally don't like seeing this in my opener. 
It's a non-starter even with the field spell, and we have plenty of other names for Bone Party if we have to kick off our plays that way. It does become an issue if you draw this, but cool thing about this deck is there's so many ways to get from point A to point B, and if you practice enough with this deck, you can easily find lines where even if this is in your hand, you can still maximize your use of it as a very powerful extender. Both effects on this are hard once per turns. Next up, a more agreeable one of, we are on one copy of Memento Horn Dragon, a retrain of Trihorn Dragon, a card that haunts every digital LOB draft I have ever done. If you have three or more mementos with different names in your graveyard, this is a free special summon that can be performed once per turn. However, it is worth noting that there are no summon restrictions on this card, so you could, in theory, tribute summon it or special summon it via an applicable effect. If Horn Dragon is destroyed by an effect, you can target exactly two face-up cards your opponent controls and one memento card you control and destroy them, which is a big reason why I wish monsters stolen via mace were treated as mementos, but it is what it is. Only one, while as this is a solid extender, it only becomes so when you've reached the point in your combos where you'd probably already be searching for it. The second effect is a lot more useful than it previously was, as now it is very much feasible to craft an end board that does include Horn Dragon on it. Being able to end on Horn Dragon and Bone Party is an incredible swing going into your opponent's turn and one that I do want to highlight here. So, as your opponent has two cards that you want to destroy, you can fire off your Bone Party destroying Horn Dragon to special summon out Anguish or Dark Blade if you have back row that you want removed. Bone Party resolves, you destroy the Horn Dragon and summon out Anguish for this example. Now, unlike what we highlighted with Dark Blade where we were using Bone Party to dodge a negation, we'll actually get to trigger Anguish's search here. Better yet, since you have two simultaneous triggers, one in Horn Dragon and one in Anguish, you can sequence them to block out any direct response interaction that you may be concerned with. So let's say our opponent has a monster negation on board, we can sequence Chainlink 1 Horn Dragon targeting their two cards in Anguish, then Chainlink 2 Anguish. Now on Chainlink 3, even if our opponent negates and destroys Anguish, Horn Dragon will still get to resolve, since it only needs to target the Memento monster we control, not actually necessarily destroy it, and our opponent's two cards are gone. I know I keep saying with the new support in this video, but the new stuff really is worth mentioning that often, and it makes Horn Dragon so much stronger than it previously was. And closing out the Memento monsters, we are on one copy of Combined Creation. So this is another little bit of a contentious one of, depending on who you ask. This deck, despite the new stuff, does greatly suffer from not having combined creation on field. While we do have some more consistent access to other plays that this deck can put out, and we can still link climb pretty well depending on the circumstances, losing access to Cranium Burst 5 negation and Mace's Snatch deal effect is pretty rough. That said, the biggest issue was combined creation getting sniped out by a DD Crow. But due to the new lines this deck now performs, combined creation isn't necessarily always hitting the graveyard before it's summoned, and plenty of times it will actually just come down from your hand, or is hitting the graveyard so late in the combo that if your opponent had DD Crow, there would have been many other solid options to hit before combined creation even got to the graveyard. While you don't want to open combined creation generally, it does make Bone Party more or less free since you don't mind combined creation in the graveyard, and it is a great send off for the fusion spell as well. All that being said, I've been playing one copy since the first wave of support released, and it has been going pretty well so far. So, what does Combined Creation actually do? Well, first off, you can't normal summon or set it, and must instead special summon it from either your hand or graveyard by shuffling five memento monsters with different names from your hand or graveyard into the deck and or extra deck. Next, if your opponent uses a card or effect on a soft ones per turn on a new chain, you can special summon out a memento monster from your hand or graveyard. Really, really good to know, this does not target, so your opponent has to decide their response to this before they know what you are summoning or where it's coming down from. And lastly, if he is your only monster on field, he can attack all monsters your opponent controls once. This actually has been happening somewhat less with this deck's ability to build boards now on turn 3 and beyond, but it is also worth knowing that you can ladder up your monsters into access code, then if the board state is right, clear everything you can with access code, banishing himself for the last cost of destruction to clear anything that might stop your OTK via combined creation. 
Bonus, Bone Party's Engrave Effect can give Combined Creation Piercing on a 5,000 attack body, so don't laugh at that Axosco banishing itself for cosplay, as it does come up from time to time. So, that is it for our Memento Monsters, let's talk about our Memento back row. First off, we are on triple copies of our field spell Memento Titalian, a name that two different websites have assured me I am saying correctly after giving me two entirely different pronunciations. I'm pretty sure the one I just did was neither of those. This field spell is pretty great, but let's start with one of the lower impact effects first. When your Memento monster battles, your opponent cannot activate any spells or traps until the end of the damage step. Very important to know, this has no bearing on continuous back row that may have activated effects and is only preventing the activation of new back row. It doesn't come up too often, but it is really good to be aware of. Next, if a monster or monsters you control are destroyed by battle or card effect, you can target one of those monsters, then special summon a memento monster from your hand or graveyard with a level lower than that of the targeted monster. So while the effect does initially target, that is only to give you the max level that you can summon. So for example, if Dark Blade is destroyed, you can target them, then you have access to a level 3 or lower that you can special summon. That special summon does not target. This also applies to any monster you control, so something stolen off of Maze being destroyed can trigger this, despite going to your opponent's graveyard. Keep in mind, this card cannot target a destroyed Xyz or Link monster, as they do not have levels. This effect is a hard once per turn. Additionally, on a soft once per turn, during the end phase of your own turn, we can target a memento back row in our graveyard and set it to the field. While this is a soft ones per turn, I've never really explored metaversing into it to get to back row, but it's just something worth being aware of. We're on three of this, but no terraforming, as this is kind of analogous to Magnificent Map and Flanderese, as it can't self-start plays, but it can greatly open up the plays available to any hand. However, while we run terraforming in Flanderese, we don't hear because Flow only has one pure one card open in Rubina and requires the field spell in order to enable all of our other birds to go off, whereas Memento has four one card opens and the field spell enables a fifth card to be full combo. Next up, three of a card that we've talked about already quite a bit in this video, Memento Bone Party. Bone Party allows you to, on quick play speed, destroy a Memento monster from your hand or field in order to either add a Memento with a different name than the destroyed monster to your hand, or special summon it to the field in defense position. We've more or less covered the various uses for this, but it's basically our version of Advent for Adventure for this deck. Beyond that effect, during your main phase you can banish this card from your graveyard, target a Memento monster you control, and it gains piercing until the end of the turn. Works pretty nice with our previously mentioned 5,000 attack multi-attacker. It doesn't come up often, but this does work for any memento monster as well. You're not exclusively locked into only giving combined creation piercing. Both of these effects are hard ones per turns. Three of this as it's pretty universally live and allows for extension through some hand traps or just extending out a board to end on more interruptions. Plus we have that horn dragon play that we mentioned earlier, which is really, really fun. And now finally, new support. We're on two copies of Memento Fusion, a semi-generic fusion quick play spell. During the main phase, you can fusion summon any monster so long as you use a Memento for at least one of the materials. A play that has happened is going second, normal summoning Anguish with several other Mementos in hand, using her to attempt to search Tatsu, then in response to an Imperm that was fired, fusing into Guardian Chimera, resolving Anguish, then Guardian Chimera, then using the fusion spell's second effect to clear the Guardian Chimera off the field and get our fusion spell so that we can go forward with our Tatsuno Toshigo plays. I've zeroed in on this as a problem that this deck had, and still kinda does, is that opening an overabundance of memento names can be detrimental since the majority of them are normal summoned. And the second effect of the fusion spell that we just hinted at is that during your main phase you can destroy a monster you control, and if you do, add any one memento spell or trap from your deck to your hand. This also helps with Nibiru plays since we can out our own Nibiru and again, go on with the Tatsune Otoshigo plays. Jumping back to the fusion effect, in addition to being generic so long as you are using a Memento monster, you can also shuffle monsters from the graveyard back into the deck as material as long as a Memento monster you control has been destroyed during the turn that you are using this card. This may sound detrimental to getting your name count high enough for combined creation, but you will very easily get it back over 5 by the time you're ready to drop combined creation, don't even worry about it. 
Another note, only materials from graveyard go into the deck. Anything that you're using from the hand or field will still go into the graveyard. So if you open Combined Creation, you can use him as material from hand, and he will go to the graveyard where you want it, regardless of if your other material or materials are going into the deck. Both effects here are hard ones per turns. We are on two copies of this, as while it is a starter, it requires for you to have the materials in order for it to act as one. However, Memento Fusion can search itself in cases where you don't need the search for something else, and Twin Dragon is an amazing turn 3 extender to set up for OTKs. Next up, we've got one copy of Memento Cranium Burst. Cranium Burst is a continuous trap that has single-handedly won games before. Once per chain, when your opponent activates a monster effect on field, you can target a comb combined creation you control. It loses exactly 1,000 attack and defense, and if it does, negate the effect. So essentially, you have five once per chain negations. While this can only interact with effects that activate on field, so no hitting hand traps or engrave activations, it does work against anything that tributes itself for cost, for example, just so long as the initial activation was on the field. Additionally, this does have to be in direct response to the activated effect, so it can potentially be chain blocked by simultaneous activations. Limitations aside, this is still a very strong piece of interaction. So long as this is on the field and you control Memento Monster, all of your opponent's monsters, if able, must attack your Memento Monster with the highest attack. This actually will force your opponent into their battle phase if they have anything on the field in attack mode, and they will likely have to ram into a very large combined creation. This doubles as protection for SB Little Knight, especially if your opponent doesn't read this card and skips ahead to try to clear the Little Knight by battle. One copy only on this, as it doesn't accomplish much without combined creation and doesn't do anything to enable our plays, so opening it isn't exactly ideal. Rather, we want to search it or send it to the graveyard to recur with the field spell later on. Next, and our last Memento card, we've got one copy of Memento Fracture Dance. Fracture Dance, if you control Memento Monster, targets a card on field and destroys it, either side of the field by the way. Then, if you control Combined Creation, you get an additional non-targeted destruction on resolution afterwards. A niche interaction that has come up, if there is a card on field giving something else protection from destruction, let's just say Dark Magician the Dragon Knight, with Fracture Dance you can actually target and destroy the Dragon Knight with part 1 of the effect, then because the second destruction is a non-targeting add-on that happens afterwards, you can now destroy one of their back row, since Dragon Knight is already off the field by the time this portion of the effect is resolving. Combined creation must be on field at the time of resolution for this effect, however. So if you only control combined creation, you use this Chainlink 1, and on Chainlink 2, your opponent removes combined creation from the field. When the chain resolves, Fracture Dance will still resolve, since you did meet the requirement at the time of activation of having a Memento Monster, but because at resolution, combined creation is no longer on the field, despite having been there at activation, you will not get the second portion of the effect to destroy something non-targeted. Fracture Dance's second effect is that when a Memento monster you control battles an opponent's monster, you can banish this to lower the attack of all monsters your opponent currently controls by 1000 until the end of the turn. Both effects are hard once per turns. Only one copy of this as well, four copy of this as well, four as Cranium Burst. This is recurrable via our field spell every turn, which is incredibly strong, and you generally are not going to use the banish effect until you're ready to swing for game. Now for the generic stuff, let's start with the hand traps. First off, three copies of Ash Blossom and Joy Spring, just generically good right now in most cases. Next, three copies of Infinite Impermanence for more or less the same reason. We're on two copies of Droll and Lockbird, another card that I just think is good right now overall, and two copies of Nibiru. Nibiru, I think, is the most iffy of these, but it can work well in some cases, especially when paired with other hand traps. Nibiru originally was a problem for this deck to play, as our lines were limited and Nibiru shuts off Tatsune Otoshigo's special summon, but we now have alternate lines that can get the fusion spell into rotation faster, which enables you to remove the Nibiru from your field so you can go off with your memento plays. And a big part of our hand trap lineup, two copies of cross Eyed Designator. So we can generally play through one interruption pretty well, depending on when it happens, two if our hand is really solid, but we want to maximize our setup. Our hand trap lineup all do significant damage depending on where they are used against us, with the exception of Droll, but we'll get to that in a moment. Ash obviously hits us at every step of the way, and so does Infinite Impermanence, as remember, the destruction is not a cost, rather an effect. Nibiru is interesting and entirely depends on when we get hit and the content of our hands. 
The majority of our hands do end us off with SP Little Knight if you're going non-budget with this, alongside Combined Creation. So unless your opponent opened both Infinite Impermanence and Nibiru and sat on both until the very end, we can very easily dodge Nibiru at our combo end. If we do get hit mid combo, which does happen because the new support extends our lines quite a bit, I have a video coming out later with all the one card lines that I mentioned earlier, it depends on if we were able to get combined creation into rotation yet or not. Generally by the time we're nibiru we've used the fusion spell so we can salvage it by dropping combined creation and destroying the token with the fusion spell to get back row into rotation, but if they hit us before we get combined creation into rotation, it can be an issue. Drill is actually the least impactful, however, it's part of why we actually aren't playing terraforming besides the reasons we spoke about before. Getting drilled off of Anguish is frustrating, but hardly the end of our combo. We can still end off with Combined Creation and whatever else we opened in hand, potentially some back row as well if we got the field spell. Basically, Droll is just reverting us to Wave 1 Memento, which, while not great, is hardly the end of the game, but Droll off of a Terraforming was much more turn-ending. Droll is also pretty solid right now generically, so it's doing double duty as just being good and being a good cross out target for our lower reaching hands. You could bump Designator up to 3 and play a 41 card deck, but I've been pretty happy with 2 so far. The only commonplace target we aren't really on here is Effect Veiler, and that's mostly for deck space and to keep us having a variety of different coverage in our hand trap lineup. And one copy of Call by the Grave, because it's limited and it lets us hold a cross-out designator for either Nibiru or Infinite Impermanence later in the turn. And to close out the main deck, we are on one copy of There Can Be Only One. It seems a little bit silly at one, and I honestly might cut it, but it just totally shuts out some decks from playing, and every monster in this deck is a different type, so within Archetype, we don't ever really have to worry about playing into our own There Can Be Only One. Okay, so that does it for the main deck, let's go into the extra deck. And we're going to kick it off with one copy of Memento Twin Dragon. Twin Dragon is a retrain of my boy from Forbidden Memories and the hero of Season 1 of our Nightmare Trobador playthrough, Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon. On Fusion Summon, you can destroy a Memento monster you control or in your hand and add up to two mementos with different names from your deck to your hand. Absolutely insane search power here. Bonus, Twin Dragon can destroy himself with this effect. And why would we want to do that? Well, because when it is destroyed, you can target a level 6 or lower memento in your graveyard and special summon it. So the search is almost free in most cases. Generally, if you make this, you'll have it self-destruct to search combined creation Horn Dragon, and then at bare minimum, you can special something out of your graveyard, special summon out the Horn Dragon from hand, link them off into either IP Mascarena or SP Little Knight, depending on your budget and fear of Nibiru, and then make combined creation. Every single one card line enables this as part of your end board, and we have 10 one card starters in here. Additionally, as long as Twin Dragon is face up on the field, any monster destroyed in battle by one of your memento monsters is banished instead. I initially thought this effect wasn't going to come up much, and while it isn't overly common, most hands you use this to establish a board, then on turn 3, it enables a very easy access code line to clear the way from combined creation. It has come up from time to time, so don't forget about it. Only one copy of this, as you can always loop it back into the deck by summoning Combined Creation, and there are much better targets for your opponent's DD Crow that generally occur earlier in your combos anyway. Next, more fusions. We have the aforementioned Guardian Chimera. Again, this is mostly there as a means of clearing out a cluttered hand of unneeded mementos when going second, plus it enables some draws and destructions as well, and the body is easily cleared up with the fusion spell afterwards, letting you use Tatsuno Toshigo's effect later. Plus, remember, our fusion spell is a quick play, so it can act as an interruption in some cases. Something to keep in mind is that Guardian Chimera's effect is ashable, since drawing is always part of the effect. I just always like mentioning that about it. Next, we have three super polymerization targets in Preta Plant Dragostopalia, Garura Wings of the Resonant Life, and Mud Dragon of the Swamp. We can actually make any of these natively as well, but we are rocking Super Poly in the side. You could swap the Preta Plant out for Starving Venom Fusion Dragon, which is a bit more generic as well, but Preta Plant Dragostopalia, funny enough, has come up before, and I kind of like having it as an additional piece of negation that we could randomly rip out of the side deck. We have a small double Isaias package consisting of Assembled Nightingale, Downer Magician, and the boy himself. Assembled Nightingale is actually summonable under There Can Be Only One, since we have two different level ones with different typing. 
Next up, we have one copy of Super Star Slayer Typhon Sky Crisis, which is still the coolest name to get to say in a video. It doesn't come up super often, but when it does, it is absolutely exceptional. Just keep in mind, you can summon this later in the turn after you've already established a board if you don't necessarily need to immediately stop a 3k or higher monster from using its effect. Now onto the links. First, we have a small access code package, starting off with Relinquished Anima. Aside from being part of that package, it is just a generically solid card for anything that natively plays level 1s, and it punishes poor board placement when it does get to come up. Next, we have Dark the Dark Charmer, Selene, Queen of the Master Magicians, and Access Code Talker. Dark Charmer is pretty easy to make in here, as darks are pretty generic at the moment. Selene is actually very interesting in this deck, as Anguish is a spellcaster and will get to use her effect when summoned via Selene, giving us a little bit of extra to do when we are going for our access code lines. And lastly, Access Code Talker is just Access Code Talker. Something that I do want to reiterate as well is that Access Code Talker can banish himself for cost if you do need to clear all your monsters off the field to allow Combined Creation to swing into everything your opponent controls with piercing damage. Closing out the extra deck, we have the duo of IP Mascarena and SP Little Knight. Again, if you want to play this more budget, you can replace the SP Little Knight with Nightmare Unicorn. IP Mascarena is uniquely cool in this deck as we can make IP, then our opponent's turn steal one of their monsters via mace, then link that monster off with IP for even more of a power swing. SP Little Knight, I know, I know it's not budget, but it's very strong in this deck, as it does address the issue of potentially losing combined creation, as we have enough other plays that there are hands where we can afford to banish out combined creation during our opponent's turn to protect it for the following turn. And again, it does help you dodge a end of turn Nibiru from your opponent, and that is always just grand. Let's go into the side deck. As always, I'm tweaking the side deck, so consider this where you have a lot of room to play if you do want to experiment a bit. It's also a bit tricky as I can't really test this deck in actual events given the biggest pieces of it aren't out in the TCG yet and it's unclear what the format will be like once they are all there. But anyway, let's get into it. First off, we have two copies of Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion. These double as both crossout targets and protection from DD Crow heavy decks, which can harm this deck pretty harshly if they are timed properly. Next up, two copies of DD Crow. Again, this is a crossout target, but I do think DD Crow is pretty strong overall if, again, it is used at the proper moment. Next up, some generic go second power. We're on two copies of Lightning Storm, just an overall really good board clear for back row or attack position monsters if need be. Following that, we have two copies of Dark Ruler No More. While this deck is big on OTKs, if we are going second, we can set up to clear our opponent's board pretty easily with combined creation if we get to go uninterrupted because of that Dark Ruin no more, and then further set up to control the game while our opponent attempts to rebuild. So really, really solid addition there. Next up, one copy of Harpy's Feather Duster, just for more back row clearance. After that, we have one copy of Triple Tactics Talents and two copies of Triple Tactics Thrust. These are much more for going second, helping us push through our opponent's interruptions and set up for an OTK, or if you don't necessarily need to go first with as many hand traps. If you don't have access to Triple Tactics Thrust, you can always replace them with one copy of Triple Tactics Talent and an additional copy of Dark Ruler No More. And lastly, we are on triple copies of Super Polymerization. This is actually something I'm kind of considering removing, but I'm still doing some testing, and when it does end up working out, it works out remarkably strong. So that is it for the... Okay, future keys be back, and let's talk about how I've changed this deck from what you saw. Funny enough, quite a few of these were ideas that I was tinkering with anyway. First and foremost, we are going to go from a 3 to 1 mace to goblin ratio to a 2 2 ratio. I mentioned there are hands where you'll burn through three copies of mace, one for its effect, and two for the names, but we can very easily rework those lines to just use two maces or just use a second copy of goblin if you really need that third name. So no worries there. Next, while Mace is a good starter with the field spell, Goblin is a starter on its own. I don't want to go to three copies of it, however, as this deck does still suffer from an overabundance of normal summons, and I don't really want to go down to one Mace either, as I like having a backup of it. The 2-2 split has been feeling solid in testing, and I haven't really missed the third Mace at all. Next change, we are off cross Eye Designator, and we've moved on to one copy of Triple Tactics Thrust and one copy of Triple Tactics Talent in the main deck. Up front, if you don't have access to Thrust, just run two copies of Talents. 
This deck can play through one hand trap well enough if your hand is even remotely good, and Triple Tactics Talent does let us check for additional interaction and give us an indication of how to build our end board if we have to be selective. Keep in mind that not all hands lead to everything, and being able to prioritize between what our deck can produce weighed against what our opponent has is a huge advantage. Thrust can get us into talents or some other cards that we're going to be talking about that have worked their way into the main deck. One copy of each, as Thrust is essentially turning all our normal spells into conditional 2 ofs Bonus as well, if we find ourselves not needing Thrust for anything else, we can always just use it to set Fracture Dance at the end of our combo. Next, we've completely removed There Can Be Only One. It just wasn't really doing anything, occasionally it would come up, but was an unsearchable one of that ultimately only really worked while going first, so I just didn't feel it was worth the space that it took up. And new additions, we've moved two copies of Ghost Bell from the side deck into the main deck. Now, we aren't on Crossout anymore, so these are purely being used as hand traps, and they are solid additions. We've talked about Bell already in the profile, so I won't go through that again. We've added Terraforming into the main deck. So I know I talked about why we don't need Terraforming, and while everything I said is true, the field spell is still so helpful, and not having to devote a mace search to it gives us additional access to some of our very impactful back row instead, and more field spell access does make the aforementioned mace usable as a starter if need be. Worst case scenario, Terraforming can sometimes eat Nash Blossom, which never hurts as well, especially with talents now in the main deck. We can also order out our plays in a way where if we are worried about Droll, we get Tatsuno Toshigo into rotation first, then if we do get Drolled, we just save Terraforming for later and go back to playing Wave 1 Memento. And lastly, taking us up to a 43 card deck, one for one. Thank you, Splenda Gaming, for putting me onto this. I completely overlooked it. I've said before an issue this deck has is an overabundance of normal summons, and one for one can turn one of those into a goblin or a mace for extension, which can free up some of our other searches as well, or it can turn a handful of hand traps into an engine bearing hand. It also is a target for thrust if you're playing it and we're in a position that we can add it to hand, so overall, good addition to this deck, it's been working well so far. So 43 in the main. I've come around to going over 40 cards with this deck. Doing the math where we are now, you have an 80% chance of seeing any of your one card opens in a five card hand. And honestly, you only really want to see about two mementos per hand and have the rest be support. Doing test hands right before rewriting the script, I did fire through 20 test hands. 19 of them had at least one memento. The only dead hand hilariously was three copies of the field spell, terraforming and a bone party, which was doing us no good whatsoever with that. I'm actually considering going even higher in deck count to try to get it so that we don't open as many mementos as some of our hands have had. Three or four is kind of excessive and we don't generally need them. But for now, I'm going to leave it at 43 and keep testing from here. Now onto the side deck, and it's going to affect the extra deck significantly, so we're going to go ahead and save that for last. Let's just take it from the top as it's been pretty majorly overhauled. We're on two copies of Dino Wrestler Pancratops. Pank is just a really solid go second card generically, and the fact that it clears itself afterwards that we can summon Tatsuno Otoshigo is majorly helpful. Two copies of Ultimate Slayer, only two, as it's conditionally at three with the inclusion of Thrust in the main, but even without it, I just like having it at two. We have the extra deck space for targets for this, and the only genre of monster that we don't really have room for a specific target for is Link, but we are adding in a Link monster that, while solid, doesn't come up overly often, so I don't feel bad about using it for Ultimate Slayer. Two copies of Soul Release. This is just another card that I overlooked initially that is really, really good right now in general. One copy of Feather Duster for the obvious reasons we have already highlighted. Two copies of Dark Ruler No More. Again, same reasons that we've already talked about. Two copies of Anti-Spell Fragrance. Okay, so this is a new addition. This deck isn't overly spell-heavy, and honestly, once it gets up and running, the spells aren't really that important. If we know we're going first, we can pull these in to help mitigate a weakness this deck does have in mass back row removal. Plus, with Fracture Dance being a recurrable two back row worth of destruction, we can potentially keep our opponent off of spells besides quick plays for pretty much the entire game. Next up, three copies of Solemn Judgment, a bit more back row destruction protection, but also just an overall good answer to basically everything. Remember, this deck doesn't need to fully stop an opponent from having a board, it just needs to do enough that their end board is crackable and we have enough left on our board to potentially OTK or completely reset to control the game from there on out. And sometimes one big Solemn Judgment play is just enough to do that. 
And lastly, and this one is just a cute bit of fun jank, one copy of Secret Village of the Spellcasters. We natively are playing Anguich, who is a spellcaster, and it's very easy to end a board with her to get this up and running. It does cost us access to our field spell and the end phase recursion that it offers, but it's a really good trade-off and our higher reaching hands don't always even need to use that end phase recursion. Plus, if it's disruptive enough that our opponent needs to just go directly to battle phase to try to out the anguish, Cranium Burst and any bigger memento on field will offer protection for that anguish, keeping our Spellcaster Village online. This is also kind of further justification for playing terraforming in the main if we open our own field spell we can always terraform out for this before we end our turn and yeah we got the lock going and for the extra deck we are off of our super poly targets as if you notice super poly is no longer in the side deck just wasn't really feeling particularly impactful enough so i cut it of the super poly targets, however, Garura is staying, since it is also a good target for Ultimate Slayer. However, we are cutting Mud Dragon and Predaplant. They're being replaced with one additional copy of Twin Dragon and one copy of Entis. Entis is obviously for Slayer, and the second copy of Twin Dragon. While it has never come up, it's just a little bit of breathing room just in case we can't cycle the first copy back into the deck for whatever reason. Next, we've removed the Double Azaeus package. I love Double Azaeus. I have never summoned Double Azaeus with this deck, nor have I ever really spotted a moment where it would have been the optimal move to do so. I have it backburnered right now, and I'm keeping an eye out for it as I test, but so far I really haven't missed it. In its place, we are running Golden Cloud Beast and Mariological Aggregator as Ultimate Slayer targets, and rounding out the third extra slot, we are running one copy of Underworld Goddess of the Closed World. She's kind of our target for links if we're using Ultimate Slayer to out them, despite not having an engrave effect, but also she's summonable via IP Mascarena for even more interruption where cases where SP Little Knight might not be ideal or is inaccessible. Plus, it's a really fun play for budget variants to do with the Mace IP line that adds some great non-targeting disruption into the mix. Okay, so that's the deck again. Re-editing this mid-video would have been a nightmare, so I added the changes I made here. I really like this deck a lot, and it's performing really well for what it is. Like I said, Twin Dragon implies the chance at additional support in some sort of level 6 main deck monster, and there are still tons of old vanillas looking to be retrained and made goth anyway, so I have hope for the future that maybe this deck can start taking the big names down consistently. If you enjoyed this video, leave yourself a memo to drop it a like and subscribe for even more, and I will catch you all in the future one card combo video that is currently in the works.